people know it as the health resort destination or the place where you get the water, but Mineral Wells also has an amazing, interesting, and pretty notable military history. We're here today with Jim Messinger, who is one of the original founders of the museum, who also was in Vietnam, and of course trained here, which we'll talk more about in a bit, and he found his wife here. And then to my right is Mary Creighton, who um, is wife to former um, Senator Tom Creighton, who also had two sons in the military as colonels. So she, she's also part of the gate committee here who helped with a lot of the projects that we're going to talk about on today's tour. So obviously she has a love for our history and our military history specifically. So today, first off, we're going to start talking about Camp Walters and that history. And then we're going to tell you about this museum, kind of where it started and where it's going. So Jim, tell us about Camp Walters. Well, Camp, I can't get all the dates right uh, on short notice, but the uh, Camp Walters was started in uh, 1925 ish and uh, was named after General Walters uh, during World War II it was the largest infantry replacement depot in the United States jump ahead just a few years we, we brag about training 40,000 helicopter pilots here during the Vietnam War and it took us about 10 years to do that in World War II they trained 15,000 infantrymen every 90 days and sent them off to the World War II. So, 40,000 in 10 years of <laughs> time. Um, and to add with what Jim had said, um, I worked at Mineral Wells High School for many years and uh, didn't realize when I was walking from the main section up to a part that we called I Building that I was passing some very historic stuff. There was a star cement in the ground, and um, there was like a horseshoe-sized wall behind it. And uh, I know one of our teachers made a basketball court out of it for a while because we didn't know what it was. And then one day it occurred to me, there's got to be something of history uh, about this. So I asked my late husband, and he said, oh yes, that used to be Camp Walters, Oh Camp Walters. As a kid, I used to ride on a truck that picked up laundry. And uh, so he got me in touch with the, the late uh, keepers of the land. And so I was able to get a lot of history. Uh, and. Uh, it, it really was interesting to see how we researched it. We got a state historical marker through Camp Walters. And uh, today we have a, a little park up there, and it's a, it's a Old Camp Walters historical park. This is where our gate committee started with uh, some uh, monuments in memory of uh, these uh, Medal of Honor people, and especially we wanted to remember uh, General Walters, who uh, was the person who trained those soldiers, uh, and uh, in our search we found that we had a local uh, guy who was a uh, Medal of Honor winner, and we're going to talk about that later, and also Audie Murphy, the most decorated person uh, in World War II, was trained here. So we definitely have a, a high correlation to history. I want to add one person's name to that, uh, just to balance it out, and that is Private Ernie Slovic, also got basic training here, and Ernie Slovic and Audie Murphy both had movies made of their careers, but nobody remembers Private Slovic, he was the first soldier to be executed in the version of World War II. At one time, Camp Walters or Fort Walters took over a big port of our city. So, give me a picture of what were the boundaries? How far out did it actually reach? They started high school. Okay. It there's the first original 50 acres. Was okay. Right there at high school. And then as it expanded, it went over to what is now the industrial park. Okay. It went to Rock Creek. Oh, okay. Long back in that area. And so the boundary was quite large. Out to the state park. Yes, it's right. Right. Yeah. Penitentiary Park. I can't area. remember how far north it was, but it went. It went Rock Creek. Rock Creek. So Penitentiary Hollow was once part of our. It was a part Camp of Camp Walters. Yes, in fact, uh, there is a booklet that shows the men uh, training in Penitentiary wow. Hollow. Wow. 
And so today we have what left of the military? It's the National Guard yes. training facility. In, in the north section of the industrial park is the, the National Park, uh, or the National Guard. And they have a sign out there that says established 1925. So they're very proud of their history. Yeah. There. There's Fort Walters National Guard. Fort Walters National Guard, and that's what they're still called for. Okay. That's what their sign says. Okay, <laughs> gotcha. And the base closed when? 1973 was 73 when, when they officially, but they didn't close it till 75. It okay. took a couple of years to actually decommission it. To get it all sorted out. We talk about size. The Fort Walters that I trained at as a helicopter pilot was relatively small compared to Camp Walters. But Fort Walters also consisted of a heliport out in Palo Pinto. The Dempsey? That yeah. had okay. over 500 helicopters there. The advanced training ran out of there. And then it went uh, to the close to the airport with Downing Heliport. So if you took in all of that property. Oh, wow. And we, we train uh, in the advanced phases. We trained by landing at various farmers or ranchers' property that gave us permission. And we had places to land in the thousands. Yes. And those were called stage fields, right? Stage fields, no, uh, uh, defined areas and pinnacles, mm -hmm. as well as stage fields. And we took in, I used to know how many counties, but everything from oh, Parker yes. out to past Palo Pinto, uh, the lake, uh, up to Kingdom Lake, north to Jacksboro, and south wow. to nearly to Stephenville. So, from that standpoint, <laughs> <laughs> a lot really of land. Yeah, yeah. And so, I, I have to confess, it was only recently, like within the last few weeks, that it connected in my brain that the Mineral Wells Regional Airport was originally the airport for Fort Walters. I don't know why it took me so long to connect the dots, but so um, in case out, you didn't know. Yeah, in 1951. That was the Air, Air Force okay. that came in here that started that, okay. built up that airport yeah. first. And then what happened to, because clearly when the, the military left such a big piece of land, what happened then to the property? I mean, we, we talked about there's a little bit left for the National Guard training area, but there's a lot of property we're talking about. What happened to that? Well, there was a lot of stuff going on. Uh, my late husband was instrumental in getting the state park for oh, the okay. state of Texas out wow. of that. And uh, then uh, the federal government chopped up properties and said, okay, this will go to the city of Mineral Wells and this is going to go to Parker County because there is a line there between, right. between the two. We, we happily uh, share of that area. And uh, so no one had a plan at that time. It came so quickly. Uh, I think they sold it to individuals. Uh, people didn't have a plan, so a lot of it just went in disrepair. Uh, hopefully one day we will have a plan and we will get that back in shape because the land really uh, has, uh, has some value and um, we hope to see it come back. Yeah, and it's currently underutilized. Yes. Um, some of the remnants out there, obviously the barracks, which is huge and mm -hmm. was for a, a long season, um, a correctional facility. Mm -hmm. um, now it's kind of a potential Texas, uh, the Texas Film Commission <laughs> kind of has their eyes on it as a possible filming location. So mm -hmm. who knows what will happen there. But <laughs> um, so we have a, a okay. pretty extensive um, barracks out there. The old My Army Hospital. was one of the last babies born there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what else is out there? The old military housing is now a, a low yes. income housing. What else? Uh, That's about it. I can say I, I lived in the the housing area when I was uh, instructor here. Okay. Uh, and of course we shopped at the PX and commissary. The buildings are pretty well gone now. The, the PX building is still there. Right. The uh, Weatherford College got a piece. Yes, the is. auditorium, yeah. And that needs to be repaired. Um, out close to the hospital is uh, North Texas Pressure Vessels, okay. which is a very uh, good company. And uh, we also have, to the north, uh, the National Guard uses some of those buildings, dormitories, and the fire, the Texas Fire Marshal. Yeah, that's right. School There's or something fire training out, out there. there. Fire yeah. training is used out there. You know, so, I should, should mention my friend, uh, Fort Walters Helicopters, oh, are yes. still repairing helicopters yes. out wow. there. So that, that, that era has not ended yet. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I know um, there was a time when I was going out looking for potential filming locations for 
uh, Texas friendly or you know film friendly. And I saw, I think on the far north side, the old remnants of a heliport. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then the shooting range out there, which I guess is the National Guard. Yes. yes. Yeah. The National Guard. So it's a pretty expansive, the, the core piece of the base. Um, it's still pretty visible that it once was a military base, but now it's primarily a, um, an industrial park. So, yeah. I will say that through our efforts as Fort Walters, uh, it, it was gate committee and now it's Fort Walters Historical Committee, we restored the gate and uh, through Jim's acquaintances and others, we got two helicopters redone. Uh, they are on the stands as they were back when uh, Walters was the uh, primary helicopter center. So those, those were actually used helicopters? Yes, oh. yes they were. <laughs> they seem so small, I oh, just no. thought they were... <laughs> oh no, Jim can tell you, they okay. were, they're like little bugs. That's, but what, we learned. Were That's what we learned. Wow. That's right, and, and I know at least one was an original. Uh, yeah. There. Okay, I thought uh, those were made for the oh gate. No. And the men who restored them said you could get in there and turn the key and go before we got them wow. where they were stabilized right. and, and stuff. So they did a great job at restabilization. And by the gate, we also have a Southern Airways uh, Memorial, which is right there close to the gate. Uh, this was in recognition of those thousands of people who worked for Southern Airways who made those helicopters wow. to go. Maintained the helicopters. Yes. They had instructors. for the, In the early days, they were the only instructors, Southern Airways. And later That's on, right. they had to add military as the, as the wow. post grew. And one of the traditions that they had was to go uh, through the blades at, um, I think it was Holiday Inn Holiday Swimming Inn. Pool. Yes. <laughs> those, those blades are right behind me here by that helicopter. Okay, oh. this is original. The very fire. same blades. And then okay. We have, uh, we have some at the Southern Airlines right, too, right. because they provided the pilot trainers and stuff. Gotcha. So, That's so really we, cool. So we have tried to keep history alive yeah. by yeah. saving some of these things, and we we are having some oncoming uh, projects. But our biggest is going to be at Fort Walters Historical Park, which is located there in Industrial yeah. Park. We'll yeah. be seeing that later. Yeah. So talking about stories, any notables for just our military history? I know we've had, you know, we talked about Audie Murphy. I recently heard Chris Christofferson trained here. Yes. So, yes. so yes, just some fun, yes. just he what did, other stories? He went to Germany instead of he Vietnam. He didn't go to Vietnam, okay. so we tend to forget about him a lot. We tried to connect to him as uh, when Vietnam helicopter pilots, when, when we started this project, we tried to connect to him. He was very sensitive to the fact that he did not go to Vietnam, so he didn't want to get his name in that pile and get people upset right, for right. claiming something. Uh, we but had he was very uh, supportive. Just, we just have just two POWs from Mineral Wells that were okay. POWs in Vietnam. I suspect we have some from World War II, but I never have heard. Um, we did once. Um, Clay Carballo's dad uh, was a Filipino, uh, but worked with United States military. He was a, a prisoner of war and was my neighbor back in the 70s, uh, but he has since passed. Um, we had John Murphy, uh, who now lives, I think, in Fort Worth or Weatherford area. Okay. Uh, and then Don Burns, uh, who, if you go out to uh, Woodland Cemetery, uh, there is a rose garden that is dedicated to his memory, and uh, Don was a prisoner of war. She knows the important people. I, I never knew any of the important people. <laughs> I, was, I was not an important person, so I'm not going to always We like to remember. So well, I, yeah, I know you're going to edit this thing, so pick out what you like what you don't <laughs> like. But the, uh, my story, first of all, I got involved with the uh, when I heard there was going to be a museum, I had been in love with the concept of a museum ever since I went through flight school here. As a matter of fact, in flight school, several people got together and, and built a small uh, museum dedicated to the Warren Officer candidates, which okay. is a very special breed, and, and I was one of those. But they, uh, you know, when the post closed, it was kind of lost and didn't work out. But when I heard they were going to do a museum, that's I didn't I missed the first meeting, and I heard that they were going to do a museum. I signed up immediately to be part of that. And the first thing we did was bring the moving wall to Mineral Wells. Okay. I was the, uh, I was the chairman for that. Jim Irwin was the uh, uh, president at the time, and he asked me if I would be the chairman for that. I said, only if you will co-chair with me. 
because he knew everybody in town. He ran a big company in town, had hired lots of people from town. And, and we did that, and at the end, the uh, Chamber of Commerce decided to give a, an award to uh, whoever did that. And they all agreed that Jim should get the award. <laughs> I spoke at every service club in Inner Wells <laughs> getting that put together. We had to provide security for 24 hours for seven days for Wow. Hours. And I went to every service club. I didn't ask anybody for money. I asked them to pick a day and provide security. Wow. Uh, and I'm told that that was the first project that both the Lions and Rotary <laughs> took part in. <laughs> That's funny. So anyway, they all agreed that Jim was the guy. And then they said, what's his last name? Half the group said Irwin and half the group said Messinger. <laughs> <laughs> it was Jim. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody knew him. And the, of course, the service clubs all met me. Yeah. The way with the, which put them, the, the That's people funny. in town that weren't members or something, they knew Jim Irwin very well. That's funny. Quite a story. Any that other? was, by the way, and the purpose of that was to announce to the general public that we were going to do a museum. And we, we didn't have a lot of uh, information at that time, but we, we were going to do a museum. And because of that, behind us, you see a replica of that wall, mm -hmm. only it's much bigger, isn't it, Jim? Yeah. Tell us about the wall back there. The, the wall is uh, not scale, but it's about half the size of the original one in Washington, D.C. And we designed it so that it could be changed because they were adding names to the wall in Washington and we wanted to stay, stay current. There's an awful lot of these walls around the country, but very few of them went to the trouble to make them so they could be changed. The traveling wall, the moving wall, some of those walls never changed from the day they were built, so they're not correct. And, and that was one of the things we wanted to do. Uh, so it is. If there's a, if the name is on the wall in Washington, it is here on the same in the same place. Wow, amazing! And you have a kiosk. I, I, I shouldn't mention it's dead right now. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. There yeah. is and will be. We, yeah, we, we had we, the first thing we did was put up a computerized kiosk so that people could go and type in a name and find a person or type in a town name and find people. The uh, Washington, D.C. was still using a paperback book for that purpose when we built, built our wall. They've moved, they've upgraded now finally to a computer. But when we have a copy of the book inside, the, it turns out that when you put a computerized device in Texas, whether it doesn't uh, last. Yeah. Really, uh, I was wondering yeah. about occasionally that. Occasionally yeah. it has problems. Yeah. So since we're talking about the wall, go ahead and tell us about the start of the, you talked about the, how kind of the seed planted for the museum, but talk about the museum's kind of history and the phases, and then tell us a little bit about what's going on now and, and where, where the museum is going. Okay. The, uh, that first meeting was a uh, formation of the Fort Walters chapter of the Vietnam Helicopter Pilots Association, and I didn't, I was busy. I think I was teaching that day or something. I teach at Weatherford College. Right. Uh, the committee met and we got organized, I got a business plan together and we incorporated in 1997 and formed a, a 501c3 nonprofit at that time. Jim found 30 acres right here where we sit. Wow. And we uh, tried to make a deal for it. Um, uh, unfortunately, the guy who was selling it to us got a counter offer from Bobby Minyard, who owned Minyard Grocery Stores, and Bobby wanted the entire piece, everything wow. he wanted, uh, the whole ranch. And the guy that was selling to us said he had promised us the 30 acres out here, and we negotiated to for 12. So we got 12 acres. There's 18 acres down there. Bobby Minyard is no longer with us, and we're hoping that when his children settle the state, we can talk them into something. Okay. But now we need more room. Yeah. We were looking for five, we got 12 and it's too small. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty typical around yeah. here. Uh, there was a condition on the, on the sale that we had to build something within 10 years. Eight and a half years later, I stood before the board and said, we're gonna lose the land if we don't build something. And we built the meditation garden. Okay. I had no idea what we were gonna do. Somebody came up with an idea of a garden one of our board members suggested we should have a labyrinth in there because labyrinths are rare in the state of Texas and it will bring in lots of people to see the labyrinth trail. The guy that built it for us actually put in two labyrinth trails because the artist that 
we still didn't know how to build a garden. My wife was a master gardener and somebody on the porch said, Jim, can't the master gardeners do something for us? Asked my wife and they said yes. They drew a plan for it with two labyrinth trails. We hired a company in Weatherford and they did the infrastructure and then the master gardeners did the planning. I did the uh, irrigation system. And, uh, uh, the meditation garden 2007, we opened that. Ribbon cutting, 2008. In 2006, when we were building in seven, a group of people came over. If you look at that wall back there, the white with the gold nameplates on it, the 52nd Aviation Battalion had that wall in Vietnam, Pleiku, Vietnam. It was built in uh, 1965, and uh, they had a uh, ribbon cutting with General Westmoreland there. When the North Vietnamese took the country, the first thing they did was bulldoze that because you don't put your memorials in their country. So the guys saw us and they said, is there any way we could get a piece of property to rebuild our memorial? Wow. And of course you can. You can have that piece right there. <laughs> That's awesome. And so they the actually, there were some that came out and physically worked on it. They, the same wow. guys that did it in Vietnam, some of the same guys were here. Working. Oh, that's awesome. So it's the only one in the world. There'll never be another one. We, we have it. That's really cool. 2009, the helicopter, 2008, eight, late 2008, the helicopter went up. 2009, the wall started being built. 2010, we built the visitor center. And every year since then, this is 2011 over here. 2012 was the Semper Fi Garden. 2013 was the Navy Garden. And I don't remember what we did in 2014 for sure. But that's about the time we started planning the big building. And we started construction on that in uh, 16 or 17. I've lost track of time. It had some serious challenges. We had to change contractors in the middle of the project. He spent all of our, the guy, first guy spent all of our money oh. and didn't have a dried in building. So, and the, new, the, the new contractor is my son-in-law. He's never been a contractor. <laughs> but he knows how to build. He's built two houses for my daughter and himself, and he said he could do it. He works full time. He's volunteered to do it. Wow. And uh, I argued with him, and he insisted, so he's building it. Tell him about the helicopter, didn't you? Helicopter? Yeah, that you got. When did you get that? Oh, gosh, I don't even remember. Two years ago, wasn't it? Uh, two, or three. two or three years ago, yeah, that came out of California. Of Federal life. surplus property yeah. uh, had that available, and the price was right. Yeah, we had to drive out to California, pick it up, and bring it back. But it was uh, it was built in the 1950s. Those helicopters were, in their day, they were the best helicopter in the entire world. Everybody bought them. They're built by a Sikorsky mm -hmm. company. Uh, and that one uh, was used by uh, it was the president. In the, yeah, it's got the president. Uh, pick, uh, was it Johnson? Or it has the president's colors. It was Eisenhower. Eisenhower. Was the president? It's got the president's colors. It was in the president's fleet. We can't prove that Eisenhower actually got into it, but they had those helicopters and they didn't use the same one all the time. So the odds are good that, that some pres some president had flown in it. In it. So tell us about the building because that's the next phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> We got kind of idle for a while while we were planning, and, and uh, we got a guy that designed, designed it and was going to build it. You already heard the end of that story, but uh, uh, it's a two-story, 20,000 square feet, and we have pictures on the inside of the visitor center to show people what, what we're doing down there. Uh, obviously, the little trailer is, uh, has a gallery of about 300 square feet, and over there we've got 20,000 square feet. So the important thing is we'll have uh, professional exhibits mm -hmm. in the first floor. The entire first floor will be professional exhibits. We'll have one of our training helicopters in there. The second floor will be our art gallery uh, for about a third of the top floor. And then half of what's left will be a, a multi-purpose room, theater kind of a thing. We'll have a large library and office space in the, in the rest of it. Now that that's a... The guy that drew this up, it was a four-phase plan. That's phase one. Okay. So other buildings can be added to it. Okay. And we have, we're already talking, because of the success this direct mail company has had for us, we're already planning phase two. We don't have money yet, but yeah. we're planning phase two. We'll, we'll get, we will get the money. <laughs> not a question anymore. And, and I, I won't have to get it all. <laughs> I'm 
By the way, I started, before we met those guys, I had started a build, builder's club for $10,000 do donation. You get to be in the builder's club and get your name in the, on the building. Uh, that little sign over there by the visitor center was the what's what bought the property. Wow. I invented the landowners association. $1,000 got you a, a, I think I gave them a share of stock on that one. If you get a share of stock, and you'll be uh, on the landowners. And they got a, a great granite uh, stone over there with their names on it for, mm. for $1,000. Uh, building. Oh, phase two, phase three, phase four. We're already talking. Uh, the deal was, has always been since the beginning, was if you want to continue, this is designed so that you can continue relatively easily, and it's all about the money. Do people want a bigger Vietnam War Museum? Do our people willing to contribute to a bigger museum? And if people contribute and want, we will build. So you mentioned that if the rest of the land becomes available, that you want it because you're growing, you're, you're we already know what busting we're gonna do it with seems. It we get it. Are you sharing that yet? <laughs> Are you, are you sharing what you want to do with it? No. Okay. No, no, no that's okay. That's okay. Jim is quiet. Yeah, no, well, I don't blame you. I can't keep a secret. I'm, I started <laughs> leaking the, the building stuff uh, <laughs> early on, and uh, uh, I just, I told the Army, don't tell me any secrets. Cause I yeah, don't keep them well. not but, good with that. But we don't know. I mean, first of all, it's just a dream that we might get it, and if it's overpriced, we might not want it. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we already have it discuss the possibility of it. Yeah. I mean, I'm running out of parking space. Yeah. Yeah. The, the guys that mow the lawn are happy because we're losing grass very, very <laughs> rapidly. <laughs> um, tell us about the little statue right out here. Soldier's Cross. Soldier's Cross. And it's interesting because that was started in uh, the Civil War, as I recall. The people died on the battlefield. They used uh, their helmet or rifle or whatever to mark the spot that because they had to come back and get them. They marked the spot with something like that. And, and ever since then, it's been used to mark the spot. Vietnam kind of started the idea of using it as a memorial. Uh, and there's a bunch of those all over the country. They're very inexpensive to do. And, and it's, uh, it's very meaningful. The Iraq and Afghanistan volunteers are doing their own, own version of that with their rifle and their helmet. It honors those that gave the full, full price. Um, I was walking the wall a few months ago, and I noticed in the ground coins and things. Yes. What's that all about? <laughs> we don't keep up with it like they do in Washington. In Washington D.C., people started leaving trinkets at the wall, and they have collected. They have collected all of those, and they have them in storage. And they're they're trying to build. The, uh, they tried to build an education center. They've given up on that. So I don't know what they're going to do with that stuff in the long run. It, uh, Might go to Smith's Mode. They still have the stuff stored, so maybe someday they'll be able to successful in, in putting together a display for it. We didn't have the uh, capability to enough volunteers, enough people, enough space to, to really keep up with it. But it, it, I don't know when that tradition started. I know it, it's possible that it started with Vietnam. But uh, the soldiers would come up. If they leave a coin, it has some meaning. And somebody told me the other day the value. And the amount of coins. The amount of coins and the amount or the amount of money if, or both. If I served with you, this was one value. Okay. Yeah, but sometimes they leave a can of beer, <laughs> and they come out and have a beer with them. Here's to you, bud. <laughs> gotcha. And they leave one for him. And they yeah, one. that's cool. Sometimes it's flowers, you know, a variety yeah. of things. Sometimes if the if the their friend had some special thing that he always talked about, you know, a teddy bear. Or yeah. Whatever, they, they'll leave something like that. So it's really just more of a personal memorial to somebody on the wall. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, this, these two paintings are two of the top three uh, images from the Vietnam War. Uh, this one was a monk who burned himself on the street, and these two paintings were both done in what's called gunpowder art. The gunpowder artist called me up and asked me if he could donate these paintings to us, so we now have two of the top three done in gunpowder art of Vietnam. We just, the third one is a little girl running down the street naked. It was, uh, her clothes were burned off in a napalm attack. 
this is a uh, uh, South Vietnamese uh, Secret Service man executing a North Vietnamese spy. Uh, gunpowder art, what they do is they paint the picture and then they pour gunpowder on it and light the gunpowder to get that effect. So it's, it's pretty fascinating. This is probably the top guy in the country. He studied under the top guy in the world. So This represents my living area in Vietnam for 13 months. And I didn't have the wood that you see. The wood on the floor actually marks my space. I have this cot and I can have just enough room here to kind of walk in sideways to get to my cot and then sit down. There were 20 of us pilots living in a tent, and this was my area. We took these boards and we made little wall lockers and foot lockers out of them, so I had room for my two little lockers right here, and then there was another guy there. Now, we were officers. We were helicopter pilots, so we were officers. We were, we were living, the, living the life there. <laughs> this is a stereo system that most of us bought while we were in Vietnam. You could buy them at the PX, and they were really, really inexpensive, and they were top of the line for its time. He was a sergeant. He had this in his room. And those are his tapes and speakers and amplifier. And if you don't believe me, we have his pictures and his name on the wall of this device in his living quarters in Vietnam. <laughs> this is our homage to the Second World War people. This is Kilroy. And a lot of people remember Kilroy. Military people tend to remember him. But Kilroy was in World War II. Every time the soldiers captured town in Europe, they walked into town, there was a picture on the wall of a guy peeking over the wall with a big nose, and it said, Kilroy was here. They never found that guy. We caught him. <laughs> his dog tags say Kilroy, his name tag is Kilroy, and we're keeping Kilroy. We're not letting him. These letters, I ask people if they can read these letters, and most people can't. They don't recognize them, but these letters are Cyrillic. They're Russian. This is a shell casing from a big 122 millimeter shell that they used to shoot at us. And the Russians were not in the Vietnam War. But one of our soldiers brought this home in his duffel bag. The only part I got to see when I was in Vietnam was the part that's missing up here. <laughs> so it's kind of a treasure for me to have the bottom. So we're standing in the middle of the Medal of Honor Memorial on Fort Walters, or the old Fort Walters, now the Walters Industrial Park. What's significant about each of these men is that they were all at one time stationed here at Fort Walters. So they have a significance not only in military history, but in our history too. Good morning, this is Mary Creighton, and we're at the Medal of Honor Memorial here at Fort Walters uh, Park and uh, it's located inside uh, the Industrial Park of Mineral Wells. This is a very important uh, monument or memorial to Medal of Honor uh, recipients who trained either at Old Camp Walters or Fort Walters. So it's not all of the Medal of Honor people, these are special people to us. And uh, we have 18 presently. Uh, there are two that I would really like to talk about this morning. Uh, the first being Audie Murphy. Uh, I'm sure most of you have seen a movie with Audie Murphy in it, or you've heard of Audie Murphy. Audie Murphy was a very young man when he went into the Army in World War II. He was raised in the country uh, near Greenville, uh, but he really was good with a gun and uh, he could shoot rabbits and all kinds of things uh, just better than most people. So he came to train here at Fort Walters and then soon went on into the military and was known as the most decorated soldier of World War II. And uh, so we are, we're uh, honored to have him on our wall. We have a local person who was raised in Garner uh, he had a large family, and they, they were very patriotic and loyal. Uh, he had several brothers that were in the military with him also, and his name was Jack Knight. Uh, Jack and his brothers went to Burma during World War II, and Lord Mountbatten was uh, in charge of that group. And uh, during one of the big fights, uh, Jack was killed, but he was, uh, he was honored by saving many of his comrades. And so uh, we have him over here on this wall. Uh, Jack, uh, his family still in the area. And uh, 
some something to an aside, Roy Knight, which was um, I think he was a a brother or a, maybe a one of the family uh, was a prisoner of war during uh, the Vietnam era, and he was brought home uh, to be buried close to Jack over here at Holder's Chapel Cemetery uh, near Garner. And uh, so we really want to recognize Jack and, and his family for all they did for us. This is my favorite awardee here, Sergeant Joe Hooper. He trained here at Fort Walters to be an Army helicopter pilot. When he left uh, Fort Walters, he went to Fort Rucker for advanced training. And one weekend he had a pass. He went down to the Gulf Coast and got into a disagreement with some of the locals there, ended up in the local jail. As a result of that, he did not make it back to formation Monday morning, and they threw him out of flight school. Uh, the idea that you would have a sergeant that went through flight school is really unusual, so he did not finish flight school as a result of that. Instead, he just went to Vietnam as the sergeant that he was. He was an airborne sergeant, and airborne guys are pretty tough and mean. That's why he got into the fight in the first place. He was at a, the Battle of Tet in Vietnam, and he started attacking enemy positions. <clears throat> if you find his citation, part of it says he was wounded seven times. I always ask my infantry friends, how many times does it take before you sit down <laughs> and relax? The rest of his story is even more interesting. He came home from Vietnam, and most people don't know, but if you have the Medal of Honor, you cannot go back into combat unless the president approves your request. He went to the president, requested to go back, and the president let him go. In his second tour, he was, he was not up to his usual speed. All he got was the Silver Star that time. 